Welcome to Sightseeing Japan, the podcast where we explore the land of dramatic climatic change. I'm Paul Bresson. And I'm Jason Neeling. And today is going to be real depressing because we're talking all about climate change and how the world is coming to an end. Right, Paul? No. Oh. You sure that? I mean, that's what I have notes on. Um, okay, I guess I'm going to do most of the talking today then. <laughs> Just kidding. We're talking about the seasons, the four seasons, which are very important in Japan. But Paul, before we get there, if you don't mind, I have a few announcements that I wanted to share. Okay. Because I've been doing some work on the website. Because we've had listeners asking for certain things. And I got some ideas to improve the website. So I already talked about how I added the episode list section, right? That lists out all of our episodes and puts them in nice little categories and makes everything easy to find. Yep. Well, things just got a little easier to find, Paul. Okay. Because now there's a search bar at the top of that. And you can type in anything, the name of a city perhaps, or a certain food that you're interested in, or some cultural thing, and it will give you a list of all the places that we've mentioned that on the website. That's awesome. I think so too. That's awesome, man. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I think I talked in a recent episode about how I was starting to go through each episode and making like these little outlines so that when you're looking at each episode on the website, it'll tell you the things that we're talking about and you can see like how they're spelled and that kind of stuff. So you can Google it on your own if you want to do more research about it. So as I get further along that, the search function is going to become even more useful. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So there's that. Uh, another thing I added recently is on our travel tools section of our website where you can find little things that you might find helpful if you're planning a trip to Japan, I just added a packing list because a listener had emailed and asked if we could do an episode about a packing list. And I thought, well, let me just put the packing list on the website. That's a great idea. Thank you. So check that out if you're planning a trip soon. This is great. All those times I've been doing my research and I've been like, I feel like we at least mentioned this before. And I'm like, oh, let me just go back and listen to these 100 episodes and figure out which one is. No, I'm just going to go to the website, type it in. Exactly. That's going to pop right up. Oh, episode 43, that's right. Yeah. It might not have, these notes might not have every single thing we mentioned, but like anything that we talk about in any reasonable amount of depth, you know? Yeah. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention, just because Japan recently opened up and a lot of people are planning trips to Japan, I just want to throw this out there again that the first 10 episodes or so are probably going to be like the most immediately useful to you if you're going to Japan for the first time. Because we talked all about planning. Episode one is all about planning a trip to Japan. And then we have a couple episodes about like the most popular places for people to visit on their first or second trip to Japan. And then we talked about the airports and hotels and food and all that kind of stuff. So go back to the beginning if you're planning a trip to Japan. Agreed. All right. I think that's all I had for announcements. They were good announcements. Thank you. Thanks for all your work on that, Jason. My pleasure. So back to today's topic. We're talking about the four seasons. Now, Paul, why... Are we talking about the four seasons as if it's something unique to Japan? I mean, a lot of places around the world have four seasons, right? Yes, but in Japan, they make a big deal about their four seasons. They're proud of their four seasons. It's something you'll see referenced a lot in Japan. Definitely. I've heard from foreigners living in Japan the Japanese people will talk about their four seasons as if no other country has that, like it's something totally unique to Japan. And then when you say, well, you know, in the U.S. we have four seasons too, and they're like, what? No. No, you don't. Like it's a commonly believed myth in Japan that it's the only country that has four distinct seasons. Yeah, you definitely might run into that. Yeah. Which kind of seems crazy, but I think there's a little something to that just because they're, they're thought of in a different way, I think, in Japan. Like, they're, they're very distinct. 
the differences between the four seasons. They have specific ways of celebrating each time of year. And they're just ingrained in so many aspects of the culture, you know? Like, I feel like in the U.S., sometimes I forget what time of year it is, really. Like, I have to look outside. Oh, yeah, right. It's fall. Okay, it's starting to get cold. That's the main thing, is it's starting to get cold. But in in Japan, just walking around, you would see all these things around you that only exist in the culture at that time of year. Yeah, I think you hit on a good point there. The seasons are just very culturally celebrated in Japan. But there's also something to the fact of the geography of Japan, too, where they do get four very different seasons. Not everywhere in the world does. We do here where we live, but the closer to the equator you are, I think the less likely you are to get that. Yeah. We didn't have four distinct seasons when we lived in LA. Right. It was summer and winter, basically. It was summer and slightly less summer, I think. It was like summer and then the time of year when sometimes you need a sweatshirt or something. Yeah. In winter, you would need a coat after dark. Coat? I don't know. A light coat. A light coat. (laughs) Or some sleeves. Yeah. People in LA bundle up, but you know, they're not used to it. Do you remember when LA was like just perfect weather like it never even got above like 80 degrees it was never too hot it was just kind of perfect all the time of course i remember well i feel like i've been hearing a lot lately that it's like uncomfortably hot a lot of the time they've definitely been getting some heat waves this yeah. last year or two yeah but you know that happens sometimes there when we were there too i don't know not in la i feel like if you were in the valley the valley was hot like all the time but in la especially near the coast where we were I mean, we weren't that near the coast, but I know what you're saying. We were close enough. Yeah, we weren't in the valley, which helped. I remember some pretty bad heat waves, especially because the last five years I lived there, we didn't have AC. Oh, yeah. So I remember some heat waves. Well, I do remember a lot of nights sleeping with a fan pointed at my face. Yes. I got very used to that. Yeah. Windows open, fan on. Yeah. Anyway. (laughs) So... Japan stretches quite a ways north to south, right? So there is varying climates quite a bit, whether you're talking about Hokkaido in the north or all the way down to Okinawa in the south. We're talking very different weather patterns. Yeah. And you could argue that like down in Okinawa, they don't really have the four distinct seasons in the same way that Tokyo does. Right. We're... I think going to be generalizing to more like mainland Japan in this episode. Yeah. Well, and a lot of this cultural stuff developed before Okinawa was a part of Japan anyway. So kind of makes sense. Yeah. I was actually curious. So I went to a map and I looked up some latitudes. All right. And the northern tip of Hokkaido is about 45 degrees north, which is almost right exactly where we live, actually. Wait, the northern tip of Hokkaido? Yep. Wow. We line up right about with the northern tip of Hokkaido. Huh. Interesting. And, you know, our winter is probably a month or two longer than it is in Japan, so that kind of makes sense. I wonder how the temperatures compare. I would imagine that it gets colder in Hokkaido. Well, it gets pretty freaking cold here, too. It's probably colder here, but weather's a weird thing. But we're, we're right in the middle of a continent where Japan is an island in the middle of a gigantic ocean. Yeah. So that's, that's a big difference too. But then if you go down to Tokyo, it's at about 35 degrees north. And the southern tip of Kyushu, which is the last of the main islands of Japan, is 30 degrees north. And then all the way, the southern tip of Okinawa is about 26 degrees north. Sorry, Paul, these numbers don't mean anything to me. Do you have any other comparisons with other uh, things at that latitude? I did not look them all up. All right. But it's, it's big. Well, I know Okinawa is subtropical, right? Reasonably close to the equator or something. Well, I guess if you think the equator is zero, North Pole is 90, right? Yeah. You said Hokkaido is 40, 45. 45. So it's exactly halfway between the equator and the North Pole. Yeah. And then 20, what was it? 26. 26. For Okinawa. It's like... So it's only a quarter quarter of the the way. way. Yeah. Yeah. So much closer, twice as close to the equator almost. Cool. So I mentioned how 
a lot of different aspects of Japanese culture are influenced by the seasons. I have a few examples, and we've talked about a bunch of them before. Yeah. The tea ceremony. Every element of the tea ceremony changes depending on the season. Mm -hmm. We talked about that in episode 99. Food. There's all sorts of seasonal food, and a lot of the foods, it would be really weird to see somebody eating a certain food at the wrong time of year. Yeah. Traditional Japanese cuisine is heavily driven by seasonal ingredients. Yep. Decorations, of course. You'll see all sorts of different decorations for the different times of year, and we'll get into that a little more as we go through the seasons. Uh, Poetry is influenced by the seasons. A lot of, like, real old poetry is about the changing of the seasons and all these, like, seasonal visual motifs and that kind of stuff. Yes. All sorts of art in Japan. Heavily influenced by seasonality. Yep. Kimono. Every element of a kimono is going to change as the seasons change. We talked about that in episode 20. Yeah, what I guess maybe I relearned doing this research is that you have to be really careful what patterns you pick on your kimono sometimes. You have to be ahead of the season. Like you wouldn't wear a cherry blossom petaled kimono after cherry blossom season. Even if it's still spring. Yeah, you would wear it in the weeks leading up to it to be fashionable and trendy. Yeah. And the same goes with all the other seasons. You don't want to be late to the party with your fashion. Totally. And it's not even just traditional clothing. Even modern clothing is affected by the seasons. I read an article that mentioned a family debating whether it was appropriate for the dad to start wearing his maple leaf tie yet. Because maple leaves are clearly an autumn thing. Yeah. You can't start wearing those too early, you know? Yep. And just to drive home how Japan's four seasons are maybe thought of a bit differently than they are elsewhere, I heard about a Japanese man that was living in London, and London has four seasons, right? You got the warm time of year and the cold time of year and all that. But this Japanese person said that what he missed the most from living in Japan were the four seasons. He just didn't think, you know, London's just is not the same. Wow. Just because of how it, it affects your daily life in Japan, the changing of the seasons. It's kind of a constant reminder of the passage of time. So now that we've said that the seasons are important in Japan, let's learn why the seasons are so important. And to answer that question, we need to go way back in time. All right, it's been a while, I feel like, since we hopped in the Wayback Machine. Yeah, it's kind of dusty in here. <laughs> haven't really paid much attention to it. Got to clean off the seats here. All right, so we're going back to when rice became a staple food in Japan. Okay. A long time ago. So back then, of course, Japan was mainly an agricultural society, and the rice harvest determined whether it would be a good year with plentiful food or whether people might starve to death, which would be considered a bad year. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, so you could almost say that there was nothing more important than the seasons. Like you had to keep a real close eye on when the temperature changed and you know when you wanted to plant your rice, when you wanted to harvest your rice, because your survival depended on it. Yeah, imagine not having like a farmer's almanac or something, and just being like, oh, it's been warm lately. Let's plant all our rice. And then it immediately gets cold and like freezes for three days and everything dies. Now what do you do? It would be a downer. But they knew what they were doing. They were experts. Yeah, they figured it out. You listen to that one old guy in the village. Not yet. Yeah. This is a false swarm. I remember that one time 60 years ago. You know, the seasons tried to trick us like this back then, but... We're going to do better this time. Yeah. So I saw that there's actually something called the Ancient Agricultural Calendar. Okay. It used lunar and solar movements to divide the year, not into four seasons, but into 24 seki, or solar terms. So this let people know at any time just how far along they were in the season, so they could keep closer track of the growing season and the harvest and all that stuff. But even beyond that, Paul, dividing the year up into 24 sections wasn't good enough. So each 
of those 24 seki was divided into three other phases. So in total, you had 72 micro seasons. Okay. Isn't that fascinating? It is. That makes me really realize how arbitrary the calendar we use is today. Like we almost take the week as sacred. You get seven days, two days are the weekend. We just made all that up at some point. We could do 17-day lunar cycles or we could do whatever we wanted to. We just somehow landed at seven-day weeks. Yeah. So actually, Paul, if you wanted to keep track of these micro-seasons, there's an app that'll help you do that. Ancient Japanese calendar app? Yeah, it's called the 72 Seasons app. It's available on Android and iOS, and it has trivia and materials related to the calendar, illustrations, haiku, photos. Wow. Yeah, I didn't check it out, but I might have to. Sounds kind of cool. Um, and just to give you an idea of what these micro seasons might be, there's one for when the insects awaken. There's one for the planting of rice. There's one for when the earth hardens. Like all these little changes that happen that, you know, these days in modern life, we would never even notice, you know, but they were paying attention to all this stuff. Wow. Yeah. The modern world where, well, like two or 3% of people are farmers in our country yeah. these days. It used to be 97% of people probably. Mm -hmm. Wow. Things changed in a couple hundred years. For real. It's kind of sad, honestly. Sometimes I think about like, I mean, there are societies that, you know, spend their whole lives outside and they just know instinctually like which direction is north and south and east and west, you know, they just constantly know that. Yeah. And they like just have this innate sense of like where the sun is in the sky and that kind of stuff. And we just, we lost all of that, you know? Yeah. We, yeah, bro. But I can fill out a spreadsheet impeccably. For whatever that's worth. It's the most depressing thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> right? You, you could live now, go from your home to your car and your parking garage to work or wherever else you're going in another parking garage and walk into the building and you could almost not go outside for days. Have zero connection to the outside world at all or just work from home. It makes me sad a lot of the time that we, we don't even get to see the stars anymore. Yeah, you know? I wish we could see more stars. And have you seen this stuff lately about companies thinking about like advertising in space and stuff? I saw something about that, yes. And it made me feel awful. Yeah. If I had to look up into the sky and see like Coca-Cola... I'm not sure this world would be worth living on anymore, man. I have to move to the country. Yeah. Well, you can't even get away from it in the country. You have to go way into the country. What are you talking about? It's in the sky, Paul. Yeah, but it can't have like a giant Coke in the sky above the whole world. What are you talking about? They got to, they got to put it in like a they specific place. They put it place. in space. In space, like where the stars are. Yeah. But it's still over, like, it's only covering a certain part of the night sky. If you moved far enough away, maybe you could get a better view. So they put a Coke can over each hemisphere, and then they got the whole world. <laughs> okay, okay. Those must be big Coke cans. Yeah. I've got to be, you got to be thinking way too deep about calendars and stuff. <laughs> the year 2022 of our Lord. Like, what? we have such arbitrary... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <that is> <laughs> made up stuff. Like, oh, man. But I guess you have to. Someone's got to make up a calendar at some point and everybody's got to agree to follow it. Or yeah. it'd be chaos, right? I guess. Or we could just not pay attention to time at all and just live our lives, you know? Then how would you make plans? You just or let them happen organically, you know? You just run into a friend like, hey, what are you doing right now? We'll be in 24 days from the equinox. What's a day? I don't do time. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, that's my dream, man. When I retire, I'm just going to wander the world and not pay any attention to what time it is. I'm not going to own any clocks or watches. Maybe right. I'll even throw away my phone. I'm just going to wander around. I'll, I'll feel free to just stop by any time to, to yeah. see what you're doing. Yeah, you should. Anyway, we should probably move on, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so you, did, you wanted to talk about the Heian period, right? 
Yes, but first I want to talk a little bit about how religious beliefs tie into the seasons a little bit in Japan. Okay. So both the cherry blossom viewing and the viewing of leaves in fall turning colors both tie into Shinto beliefs about the beauty and impermanence of life. Yeah, we talked about that a little bit in the cherry blossoms episode. I don't remember what episode that was. 50-something, I want to say. Yeah. And then the winter as well ties in with the concept of purification Mm. and resetting and, you know, the cycles of life. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So Heian period. Mm -hmm. It's first in the Heian period where the beauty of nature really started to be reflected in poetry. Heian period is around the 9th to 12th century, by the way. Yes. So yeah, I saw they had these big folding screen works of art where the main subject was the passing of the seasons. Yeah, and those got more and more elaborate over time into these really amazing pieces of the world transforming all in one painting. Yeah, they had the seasonal paintings that were called shikie, and then they had monthly ones too. They would further subdivide the seasons, and those monthly paintings were called tsukinamie. They also had waka poetry around that time, which I learned is a 57577 syllable poetry, if anyone cares. Okay. And I care. Not all, but a large number of these poems referenced plant life and the physical world. So the seasons started getting represented in these. I saw there was a poetry anthology from 905 called Kokin Wakashu that began the tradition of beginning a poetry collection with the four season theme. Yeah. I actually found a quick little poem from that anthology that I wanted to read, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah. I'm sure it, you know, it comes across differently in Japanese, but this is the English translation. Autumn comes lonely to this mountain village where cries of the deer constantly wake me. How does that make you feel, Paul? Deer are loud. Deer are loud? Yeah. They do, they do cry loudly. When they think no one's around. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just imagining this guy in bed in this little mountain village, and he's like, oh, man, those deer keep waking me up in the middle of the night. He's throwing rocks out his window. Get out of here! (laughs) In the early Kamakura period, which came right after the Heian period, there was a poet and courtier named Fujiwara no Teika who composed poems on monthly flowers and birds. Ooh. Yeah. And then in the Edo period, starting in the 1600s, an entire genre based on his poems became popular This genre was called the birds and flowers of the 12 months genre. Okay, sounds exciting. Yeah. Also in the Edo period, there became a custom of eating seasonal snacks around 2 to 4 p.m. Yeah. Reminded me of like afternoon tea time in England, you know? Same kind of thing. Interesting that everybody just agreed that that's that's the time of day to drink tea. Yeah. Yeah. I believe those snacks are still sometimes referred to as oyatsu, which is a reference to the Edo period. They would call 2 to 4 p.m. that period yatsu. Hmm. So that's your, that's your afternoon snacks, basically. Yeah. So in spring, people would eat sakura mochi, which is like this pink mochi wrapped in a salt-pickled cherry leaf. That's not what you had, where you accidentally ate the leaf, right? Yeah, no, that was, I think that was like a mint leaf or something. Okay. I was thinking if they're pickling this leaf, that must be, you must eat it, right? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, In summer, people would have kakigori, which is shaved ice, Mm -hmm. which is real nice on a hot summer day. Mm -hmm. In fall, maybe kuri kanoko, which is a bean paste ball covered with candied chestnuts. That sounds pretty good. 
I saw that. I don't think I've had one of those, but I'm like, I got to get one of those next time I have the chance. That sounds great. I didn't look up a picture, but just the description of them sounds pretty good. Right. It's got to be good. Yeah. And then in winter, there's something called Oshiruko, which is azuki bean soup with floating mochi balls. One of my favorites. So this brought to mind an image of you and me sitting at Kiyomizudera, and yep. you got a bowl of the red bean stuff. But that was called Zenzai. And I was like, wait a minute. So is Oshiruko something different than Zenzai? And it actually is. Oh, really? How's yeah. it different? Oshiruko is a smooth soup. Like it's more soupy, but Zenzai has a coarser texture. Like you're actually going to get kind of lumps of Yeah, there were bean. chunks of beans in there. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Similar, but a little different. Yep. I'm sure they're both delicious. I'm sure. All right. I didn't have a fun fact for the intro, but here's my fun fact about the seasons in Japan. In the Edo period, there was a common myth that partaking in the first harvest or catch of the season would extend your life by 75 days. Nice. It's a good little bonus. So the first harvest has gained a really cultural importance in Japan. And even to this day, that's reflected. As recently as last year, 2021, a pair of first harvest Yubari melons from Hokkaido sold for 2.7 million yen. I did the conversion. That's about $25,000. For a couple melons. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's about time we start talking about the seasons. All right. More specifically than generally. Sure. Let's start with spring. Seems like a reasonable place to start. The season of rebirth, right? Yeah. Interestingly enough, spring in Japan is the beginning of the business year and the school year, which I didn't know. Yeah. I guess I knew the school part, but That's I didn't know true. business year. Yeah, I didn't know that either. It makes sense, though, when you hear about like people graduating and then pretty quickly getting into the business world. It's like all these new graduates are hired at the same time, basically, each year. Yeah, the new budgets come out. They know how many people they can hire for the year. Mm -hmm. It makes as much sense or more than our fiscal year here starting in July. So just to be clear... In Japan, spring is considered between March and May. And, you know, there are official equinoxes, right, for each season, like the official start of each season. But I got the impression that in Japan, it's more just about the months. They don't pay as much attention to the, like, official first day of the season. Yeah, that stuff, I've always felt kind of dumb, too. They're yeah. always like, oh, it's the first day of winter. And I'm like, it's been cold for a month and a half. Like, yeah. what are you talking about? Right. So let's talk about the weather in spring. What's going to happen? Uh, and of course, like we said, this is going to change depending on where you are in the country. But on average, spring has temperate, sunny days. Maybe sweater weather during the day. Maybe jacket weather at night. Average highs in the Kanto region, which is around Tokyo around 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So pretty nice, pretty comfortable. Thank you for using Celsius and Fahrenheit. No problem. I know we got, we got listeners around the world. I mean, it's not impossible, but it's a real tricky converting Celsius and Fahrenheit. So it's nice just to get both. So thank you. Yeah, unless it's, what is it, negative 40 degrees those two line up? That's the sweet spot? I think so. I think that's the one temperature that's the same in both. Okay. Well, you're probably not going to get that in Japan. No. Let me double check just so I don't sound like a dummy here. <laughs> oh, heck yeah. I was totally right. Negative 40. Okay. This brain still got some juice in it. I can still remember random facts once in a while. Next time it's a negative 40 here and I'm almost dying, I'm going to be like, hey, it's Celsius too. <laughs> What about humidity? I don't know. Not as humid as summer. That's, <laughs> that's my guess. 
yeah, it starts out dry and then slowly kind of ramps up towards the summer, getting more and more humid. Okay. One thing that has become more and more of an issue for me in the spring as I age and get closer to death is allergies. Oh, man. And a lot of people in Japan suffer from hay fever, specifically from the Japanese cedar and the Japanese cypress. So you might see a lot of people wearing masks to keep the pollen out. Interesting. Although, I mean, right now you'd see a lot of people wearing masks for COVID anyway, so not much difference at this point. Yeah. I feel like I just get allergies always now. Dude, I just started getting them in the fall this year. Yeah. Like not nearly as bad as in the spring, but it's like a few days. It's just like, man, I just feel like I'm getting sick, but then I'm not actually sick. It's just There's allergies. always something. The winter's so dry and like being inside, the dust gets me. And then the spring melt releases things from the ground that gets me. And then things start blooming and it gets me. And then everything starts dying in the fall. I don't know. I don't know what it is. All the all the decomposing stuff going up into the air or something. But fall's been getting me this year too. I feel like in a few years, I'm just going to be miserable all year long. I'll just have to wear a gas mask everywhere I go or something, you know? Maybe pollution has something to do with it, too. Maybe. Maybe it's not just my failing body. We don't really live in a clean, natural world anymore. Yeah. But anyway, uh, when we go to Japan in spring, I will absolutely be bringing allergy meds. And I wanted to mention, I did a little bit of quick research. It looks like over-the-counter allergy medication is okay to bring into Japan as long as they don't have pseudoephedrine. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. And just to expand on that a little bit, if you're bringing any kind of medication into Japan, do your research and make sure that you have any appropriate documentation that they might require, that kind of thing. Yeah. There are some things that are not allowed even if you have a prescription because they're not medically recognized in Japan. And it, it doesn't matter. Like, you just can't bring it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I also want to point out that spring is a peak time for tourism in Japan, so things might be more crowded. Hotels and flights might be more expensive, but it's also a great time to visit. Yeah. We're going to talk about all the fun stuff there is to do. So let's talk about all the fun things there are to see and do in spring. Okay. So... What is probably the biggest reason that people go to Japan in the spring, Paul? It's got to be Sakura. Got to be. Cherry blossom viewing. Yeah, it's a huge deal. It's hard to overstate what a big deal they are, and they have been for a very long time. You know, Japan's oldest poetry collection from the 8th century talks about the Sakura. Wow. Yeah, even that far back. People just love those little pink flowers. Uh, Oh, here it is. Episode 51. I was right. It was in the 50s. Um, Yeah, episode 51. We talked all about the cherry blossoms, how they're only around for a very short time, and they symbolize the impermanence of everything. They remind you to stop and smell the cherry blossoms. Right? Yeah. Can't move through life too fast. Anywhere there's a large number of blooming cherry trees, there's going to be a whole bunch of people hanging out for Ohanami, which is cherry blossom viewing. They might lay out a blanket, bring a bento, bring some sake, because drinking in public's okay in Japan, and just hang out all day and watch the blossom petals fall. Yeah, it's a nice tradition. And there are a ton of beautiful places to enjoy the sakura. Like every city in Japan has a specific or, you know, multiple specific popular places where people go hang out and look at the cherry blossoms. Yeah, every city we research, there's like, this is the best spot in town to view cherry blossoms. Every city, always, it's noted. Everybody knows where to go. Yeah. If you're in Tokyo, I saw Ueno Park is a popular spot. I think that's where I went to see them, honestly. But it's been a long time. Oh, you saw them on your first trip, right? I did. I it was like our last, our second to last day in Tokyo. They started blooming. Oh, so lucky. Yeah, that was pretty cool. 
I also saw that Aoyama Cemetery is a popular place. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah, it is. Just imagining a bunch of people partying in a cemetery. I actually have walked through that cemetery, not in spring, but okay, it's a nice cemetery. I sometimes get the urge to like hang out in cemeteries, but social pressure like stops me from doing it. Dude, cemeteries are awesome. When I was living in Boston, you know, they have all these just random like several hundred year old cemeteries in the middle of the city, you know, just like nestled in between these skyscrapers and stuff. It's pretty awesome. I would go just walk through there sometimes because I'm like that. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So one bonus of the cherry blossoms is they come and go real quick. But like we talked about in the intro, Japan stretches a long ways north to south. So there's a pretty good range of times where if you're in Japan, you just got to find the right latitude or the right city and you could find cherry blossoms that are blooming. Right. And it'll change each year. Like you got to watch the, uh, the forecasts. They're you know, media outlets will have a schedule of, oh, this is when we expect it in this city and stuff. Yeah, very detailed reports. They're serious about it. Yeah. Um, But we had a listener actually that reached out recently to ask, you know, for the timing at different cities and stuff. Yeah. So I was just going to throw out this quick little thing. I have a few quick notes. Sure. Okay, so in Okinawa, this is way down south, right? Sakura bloom in early February. In Kyushu which is kind of the southernmost main island that's not Okinawa. Uh, that's around late March. You're going to see the cherry blossoms. In the Kanto and Kansai areas, which is around you know, the middle of Japan, Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, uh, and also the Chubu and Shikoku regions, that whole area is going to get sakura in late March or early April. In the Tohoku region, which is the northern part of Honshu, they get the cherry blossoms mid to late April. And up in Hokkaido, the northernmost main island, they get them in early May. There you go. Yeah, that's over two months worth of time to catch the cherry blossoms somewhere. It's like more than three months if you count, you know, down in Okinawa. Early February, February, March, April, early May. Oh, I thought you said late February for Okinawa. Shows how much I I listen when Jason talks. Maybe I did. I could have made a mistake. (laughs) No, I thought that's what you said. I didn't have notes about that. Early February, okay. in case okay. I in okay. case I said that wrong. Three months. You get three months to catch the cherry blossoms yeah. somewhere. So, Paul, we're going to Kyushu, right? So we need to aim for late March. Okay. Is that still the plan? Yeah. Yeah. I've been coming up with more plans. All right. <laughs> I've got I mean, a list. Dude, we got to get those tickets soon. You know how I am. I'm just, I'm going to be all stressed out and frantic until we get things locked down. Yeah, but I also know how you are, and we're going to get the tickets locked down, and you're going to keep checking prices every day, and if they go down, you're going to be like, oh, man, no. oh, man, we could have got them for less. Oh, no, what did we do? No. Maybe once or twice, but I'm not going to be like constantly checking. <laughs> okay, you're anything. right. You're right. I'll give you that. I'll give you that. I will never look again. No, I try. Yeah, I try to stop myself. You know, one, once you've made a decision, yeah. you can't have any regrets, you know? Yeah. Yep. It was worth it to me at that time I made the purchase. I'm not going to think about it anymore beyond that. Exactly. I don't have the capacity. So, Paul, let's talk about holidays, if you're ready. You ready to talk about holidays? Sure. Okay. There are a bunch of them in spring. Yeah. First one is White Day, which is on March 14th. This is an accompaniment to Valentine's Day. But on Valentine's Day, women give gifts to men, and then on White Day, the men give gifts to... (laughs) Oh, man. Uh, Okay, wait. That's right. Spit it out. Valentine's Day, women give to men. White Day, men give gifts back to women. But in my notes, I mistyped it, and I said, on White Day, men give gifts to men. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it is 2022. I'm sure that happens. Yeah. Specifically, women often give chocolate to men, and then men give much more expensive gifts back to the women that gave them chocolate. Yeah. They're supposed to pay them back threefold, right? Three or four or something like that is what I remember. Something like that. If you want to know, if you want to hear all the details, check out episode 69. We talked all about 
White Day. Wait, that was episode 69. <laughs> Did we do that on purpose? <laughs> I don't remember. Or was that just a happy accident? I think, I think it was a happy accident. <laughs> I think we even mentioned in that episode that it was a happy accident. I seems so long ago. I thought it was going to be like episode 14 or something. Yeah, it does feel like a while ago. Although I think we released it right around Valentine's Day. Yeah. So when it, when or, it came up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it, yeah, it wasn't just White Day. It was Valentine's Day and White yes, Day. Yes, we, we did the two together. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so after White Day, March 20th is the spring equinox, which I guess is, you know, I said the equinoxes weren't a big deal, but it is actually a national holiday. Speaking of national holidays, I was looking up a huge list of like holidays in Japan to see like which ones fell exactly where. And some of the ones that I thought were a bigger deal weren't national holidays, like not everybody got the day off work or whatever. Like, and then some of the ones that like I'd hardly heard of before were national holidays. Huh. Though I don't think that necessarily correlates with their importance in Japanese society. Because we kind of have the same thing here. We have some like national holidays that like you don't really celebrate, right? Dude, every year it bums me out that Halloween is not a national holiday. Right, right, but it's a great holiday and tons of people celebrate it. It's the best holiday, Paul. And then you have like other national holidays that like maybe a couple people go to a parade and everybody else just does nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's how it is. Do you remember what are the like big ones that aren't national holidays in Japan? Setsubun. Huh. Not a national holiday. It's so fun. Maybe I thought it was a bigger deal than it is. All the bean throwing yeah, and the dress yeah. up and everything. We've talked about it plenty of times. It seemed like a big thing. All, all the shrines are doing stuff, you know, but it's not a national holiday. I forget. Is that a specific day or is it like, you know, the third Saturday or something like that? Like, does it normally fall on a weekend? I think it's one of those. Hmm. I think I have it in my fall notes, but it's one okay. of those. Yeah, like third Saturday of X month or something like that. That might explain why it's no reason to make it a national holiday if everybody's already not working or whatever. Eh, you know, Thanksgiving's a national holiday here. I guess it's always on a Thursday. Yeah. But that changes dates. I guess that's different. Fourth of July, that could be on a weekend. That's a national holiday here. Well, but it could also not be on a weekend. True. <laughs> True. Anyways. Anyways. What do you got next? Um, so the rest of the holidays in spring are all bunched pretty close together at a time known as Golden Week. Golden Week confused me for a long time. How so? It's just like, it's all these holidays crammed together, but there's like breaks between them, but it's also kind of like they're so close, you kind of get the whole time off usually, or people take the time off and travel. And none of the Golden Week holidays are ones that I'm like super familiar with. It's like a bunch of like little quick national holidays that are like more obscure. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I, I know what you mean. Like I'd always heard of Golden Week as, oh, it's just a bunch of holidays grouped together, but I never really paid attention to exactly what those holidays were. But I have them listed here now. Okay. So the first one is Showa Day, which is April 29th. It celebrates the birthday of the former Emperor Showa. Okay. Next is Constitution Day, which celebrates the ratification of the new Constitution in 1947. That makes sense. I gotta go back to Showa for a second. Sure. There's been a lot of emperors, right? Yeah. And not every emperor has their birthday as a national holiday. What's so special about the Showa emperor? I'm theorizing that maybe they just like kept this as a national holiday because they liked Golden Week. Mm. And if they cut this out, like Golden Week shortens by three or four days. I guess so. I feel like the show up period is also one of those like romanticized times that people are really nostalgic about, you know? That's true. That's true. It was it was quite the time. Yeah. A lot happened in the show up period. Should we say when the show up period was? I think it started nineteen twenty six, was it? That's about right. I don't know exactly. Twenties to like late eighties, I wanna say. Need to Google again so I don't sound like a dummy. <laughs> Show up period. 1926 to 1989. Okay. Yeah. Nailed it. Well done, Jason. Totally. You too, buddy. 
And then you mentioned Constitution Day, and that's only been around since 1947. So that's newer mm-hmm. holiday. Then you got Midori Day or Green Day, which is about celebrating nature. That sounds pretty cool. That sounds great. I've never, I never really heard of that before. And I don't really know what they do for that other than go outside, take a hike. Yeah, I don't know. But you know, I always liked the word Midori. I think it's a pretty word when it's written out in Japanese. I think it's a pretty sounding word. It's a name too. I think it's a pretty name. Okay. And it's a, a liqueur. Yeah, is it bad that I only know that means green because I've drank a lot of Midori green <laughs> liquor? No. I don't remember what we used to do with that stuff. But I know we used to drink it when we were young. Yeah, I feel like... Is that how you make Scooby Snacks? Is that Midori? I don't know what I, Scooby I don't Snacks remember. is. It's some green shot that's gross, but gets you drunk quick. Ryan used to buy them for us all the time. Okay. Scooby snack for this guy. I guess I need to mark this as a uh, explicit episode because we're talking about drinking now. Well, we talk about drinking with the cherry blossoms anyway, right? Is that, anyway. is that how it goes? You talk about drinking, it becomes explicit? I think so. I don't know. You know, when I was researching when you need to mark a podcast episode as explicit, it was so confusing and like not really clear with all, you know, all that censorship type stuff. Yeah. It's and there's never all these really different platforms clear. too. Like to be on iTunes might have different standards than to be yeah. on Spotify or whatever. I think I just heard that Apple was kind of strict about that. So I just okay. err on the side of caution. Interesting. I feel like these days everybody's like, doesn't like smoking. So if you're talking about like tobacco, I feel like they'd hit you with that. But drinking's like so much more socially acceptable. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. So Midori Day. Anything else to say about Midori? Tokyo tea. We made that a while ago. That oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, that's right. Those are good. It's like a Long Island iced tea, but with Midori. Yeah. Uh, maybe we should do an episode on Golden Week sometime, because I don't know much. I'm ignorant. I'm somewhat ignorant on Golden Week. We'll have to see if there's enough there for a whole episode. I don't know. Okay. What's the next holiday? Uh, last day of Golden Week is Children's Day, formerly known as Boys' Day. So this is when families wish for their boys to grow up strong like a carp. We've mentioned this before. They hang those big, colorful carp banners everywhere. Yeah. Those are pretty yeah. cool. I don't know. I saw it called Children's Day, formerly known as Boys' Day. I don't know why they changed the name, because it still seems like it's kind of focused on boys. Right, right. And there's a doll festival that's kind of like a girl's day. Oh, that's on the same day? No, that's in early March. Oh, right. Like the Hina and Matsuri, right? Yeah. So so it kind of makes sense. They have like a girl's and a boy's. I don't know. We we didn't talk about that. That's in March? It's March 3rd. Oh, I missed that one, didn't I? Yeah, there's a lot of holidays, though. And which ones are big enough to talk about is, is, is questionable. All right. So that means there's national holidays April 29th. May 3rd, May 4th, and May 5th. So that gets you Golden Week. Basically a week off work, depending on where the weekends fall. Okay. And one note, if you're traveling in Japan at this time, it is one of the biggest weeks for internal Japanese tourism. So hotels are going to be full, tours are going to be packed, everywhere's going to be busy. So please keep that in mind yeah. if you're planning Plan your trip. ahead if you're going to be in Japan in Golden Week. Yeah, book your hotels way in advance. Yeah. So we talked a lot about the Sakura viewing, but a lot of other flowers bloom in the spring too. And wisteria tend to be very popular in Japan. There's even specific wisteria gardens that you can go see. Is it wisteria or wisteria? I don't know. I'm not a flower guy, Me so I could be butchering this, but there's a lot of flowers around. There's a really famous wisteria garden in Fukuoka. So there's other flowers to go see as well and really beautiful displays. All right. It is spring after all, right? Yeah. Season of flowers. So now let's talk about food. Everybody loves food, right? Absolutely. 
So of course, sakura blossoms, since they're such a big thing in spring, they make their way into a lot of foods. You can find sakura drinks, sakura sweets, sakura treats. I don't know, did you have any specific stuff? I already mentioned sakura mochi. I think I've had sakura Kit Kats. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically sakura everything, right? <laughs> sakura tea. Yeah. That's a thing. Yep. In spring, I saw that clear soups are popular, perhaps featuring clams, mussels, and sardines. And these soups might also include fresh seasonal veggies like bamboo shoots and asparagus. Yeah. Have you ever seen asparagus growing out of the ground, Paul? No, I haven't. It's so weird. It must be weird. It's so weird. Because they look like if you just went to the grocery store, bought a bunch of asparagus, and jammed it into the dirt. That's how it grows. Okay. It just pops up out of the ground. I got to learn more about vegetables. I work in the produce department now. I got I to gotta go tour some farms or something next spring. Yeah. So one interesting note about spring snacks that I don't think I've ever seen myself is sakura mochi, right? I heard that in the eastern side of Honshu, there's places that make a sakura mochi but the mochi is actually some sort of wheat dough, hmm. which I've never noticed. I've always thought of the sticky rice substance, right? Yeah, I mean, that's what mochi is. Yeah, so I want to try to find that next time, next yeah. time I'm in Japan. Huh. You know, I saw this guy making a sakura sweet. I don't think it was mochi. It was some sort of, a, maybe like a bean paste, like a sweet bean paste sort of thing, but not a red one. It was like a, it was like he had this ball of white dough and then he wrapped it in pink dough, but then he like spread the pink dough so thinly that you could kind of see the white shining through a little bit. So it was like you could see the color gradient like you do on the actual flowers. And then he had this tool so he could shape the thing to look exactly like a sakura flower. It was really amazing. That's so cool. Yeah. The presentation on Japanese food is. As good as anywhere in the world. Unparalleled. Yeah. Yeah. Strawberries are another spring specialty. Definitely. They'll be, you'll you'll go to a supermarket in spring, you'll be see strawberries packed everywhere. Oh, yeah. So the last thing I have, and I have this for, for each season, I found this website that talked about decorative motifs, specifically for kimono mostly, it seemed like. But, even within each season, it has like specific things for each month oh. that you might wear on your kimono. Oh, I saw like spring themed motifs, but I didn't see like month by month. All right. oh, okay, okay. Well, let me blow your mind then. All right. In March, you might see things like flowing water, sakura, but only from the middle of the month. You know, you can't wear it too early, right? <laughs> yep, yep. And formal fans. You know, like the fans that maybe a geisha would carry around, right? Okay. In April, wisteria, peonies, willow, and then for the sakura, you might see sakura still, but you would only want to use the blossoms for the first half of the month, and then the second half of the month, you would just see the sakura petals because they're like falling off the trees, right? Yep. Yeah. And then in May, you got more peonies, and then flowering dogwood, and young bamboo. Oh. Yeah. I also saw things that could be referenced to spring would be plum blossoms or magnolia. All right. On to summer. Yep. Uh, I saw summer is considered June to August. Or maybe midway through September. Okay. Somewhere around there. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, Weather is going to get hotter, of course. Um, Between May and July or so, depending on the part of the country, there's actually an unofficial fifth season called Tsuyu, which is rainy season. So you probably won't want to be outside very much at that time of year. And it's so humid that you kind of just always feel a little damp. Like you can never get 100% dry. Yeah. Doesn't sound comfortable at all. But notably, 
Hokkaido, that northernmost main island, they don't get the rainy season. It apparently ends in the Tohoku region in northern Honshu. Okay. Yeah. What happens past rainy season, Paul? It gets hot, it gets sunny, and it gets muggy. Ugh. The Japanese summer is no joke. Yeah, actually, heat stroke is a serious concern, too, and not even just for susceptible subgroups. Like, it's not just old people that, you know, are suffering from, uh, from heat stroke. It's like everybody. So if you visit at this time of year, be sure to stay hydrated, replenish those electrolytes, and avoid strenuous exercise. Yeah. It's tough for that time of year to be like, oh, let's just hike this 15-kilometer mountain trail. Like, you, you might burn out. Yeah. But actually, this is the only time of year, really, that you can climb Mount Fuji. Yep. But Mount Fuji is so tall, you know, it's it not gets too, cold up there. Yeah, it's not going to be too hot up there. Right. Check out episode 10 if you're interested in learning more about Mount Fuji and what it takes to climb it. Climbing season is early July to early September. And personally, that's really the only reason I'm interested in going to Japan in summer is to climb Mount Fuji. The rest of the time sounds pretty terrible. Right. I'm Uh, not into heat. That's just... Why not just wait till fall? Yeah. Uh, So most of Japan is around 30 degrees Celsius or 86 degrees Fahrenheit in summer, which might not sound like insanely hot, but the humidity makes it feel a lot hotter than that too. Yeah, 86 plus humid, uh, I'm going to struggle. Yeah. But, you know, we live in the north. I don't get that too much. I'm not used to it. Yeah. And then there's another unofficial mini season around August and September. Typhoon season. Mm, Yes. Typhoons are basically what we in America call hurricanes. So they usually just hit the southern end of Japan, but they can also show up further north as well. I just got to wonder, you're a Mongolian in the 13th century, right? Why do you choose to invade Japan twice during typhoon season? So, Paul, you probably know more about this, the history part of this, than I do. But, I mean, the Mongolians came through China, right? So, like, they're coming from the Sea of Japan side, but the hurricanes come from the other side, don't they? So Usually. Why would, are there hurricanes that form in the Sea of Japan? I believe so. Oh. Or they're still strong enough when they get to that side of Japan. They actually are strong enough to cross Honshu? I think so. They're it's probably crazy. not as strong as when they first hit land. Yeah. But Japan's not that thick. True. They got all um, those mountains in the middle, though. That's where they got the term kamikaze, divine wind. The divine wind came and swept the Mongol Mm. invaders away. Yeah. So what to do in Japan in summer? It's festival season in summer. So you're going to find Matsuri all over the place. Yeah, but you could also just stay in your hotel with the air conditioning cranked up, you know? Um, That sounds like not a great idea. Just walk down to the kombini, grab a bunch of strong zero, and hang out at the hotel. <laughs> Maybe if you're in Japan in summer, you should just enjoy the nightlife. Venture out at like 5 p.m., come home on the first train. Sure. Yeah. That's one way to stay cool. By the way, Paul, you know, I've been thinking most of my trips to Japan, like I would get up pretty early and go to bed pretty early partially because of the jet lag at the beginning of the trip. You know, you just naturally wake up early. But I feel like this time I need to sleep in a little later because there's not even all that much stuff open really early in the day, usually. So I think we should explore some of the nightlife a little more this time. Hey, I'm always down to sleep in. <laughs> I know. Oh, yeah. The One day I tried to get you to uh, the bamboo garden really early. And you're like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, you got to get there at 5 a.m. so you can get a picture without people around. It was like 7.30 a.m. or something. Felt like 5 (laughs) (laughs) a.m. But, I mean, there is some sense to waking up early because a lot of the places you want to go see a temple or whatever or a museum, a lot of the places are open like 9 to 5 or 9 to 8 to 4. So you got to get up. You got to get breakfast. You got to get on the train. You got to get somewhere. All that takes time. So it's almost like, 
you got to get up at like seven or eight if you want to make the most of the day and see as many things as you could see before the normal attractions start closing. True. But, you know, if you're hitting up more like restaurants and nightlife, that changes the equation. Yeah. We did party on Halloween a couple nights. Fairly late. I guess, yeah. And then we took the bullet train like early in the morning and I, oh man, that day I did not feel good. I don't remember that. <sighs> what did... When we went from Tokyo to... Kyoto, Kyoto and we did that whole hike that day. You were hungover for that? Yeah, I think because we went to Kaguya the night before. Yeah, we did. Yeah, and then we went to the Halloween oh, yeah. thing. Dude, I drank a lot. Kaguya was so fun. I didn't even realize how much I was drinking with that vibrating beer mug. Oh my gosh, it was so fun, dude. You must not have drank enough Pokari sweat that night, man. <laughs> Probably not. I was. Yeah, that's the magic elixir. Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was feeling it the little night, and the jet lag. Like we hadn't been there long, oh. or I hadn't been there long. Yeah, yet. I'd been there you, for like almost there. a week already, or yeah, something. So I was still adjusting. And yeah, that makes sense. I powered through. We we made it. Yeah. Anyway, now that we talked about all this stuff that no, you know, nobody knows what we're talking about. Yeah, all we've talked about so far, as I mentioned, like there's festivals in summer. We've been talking for ten minutes about summer. There are festivals. <laughs> Let's talk about these festivals. So at these festivals, you might see fireworks. You might see a lot of people wearing yukata, which is like a, a light summer kimono. You might see, well, you will see a lot of food stalls selling all these delicious festival foods. You might see festival games. You might see streets lined with paper lanterns. That's it's just a cool atmosphere, you know. You might see a shrine carried on shoulders paraded through the streets it's possible. and dancing and taiko and floats. The stuff that memories are made of. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of fireworks, I thought it was really interesting. I found out there's been a firework festival held on the Sumida River in Tokyo since 1733. Wow. And a million and a half people go to see it every year. That's a lot of people. Yeah. Fireworks are a huge part of summer. Like all the uh, slice of life anime I watch, which isn't necessarily the best representation of everyday life for the normal Japanese person, but it's like summer break or summer, we have to see fireworks. The other thing we have to do in summer, go to the beach. Oh, yeah. It's not summer if you don't go to the beach. You need a beach episode. Japan's an island. There's beaches everywhere. Skimpy swimsuits. It's great. That's more anime than real life. But yes, that is great. Well, people don't wear bikinis in real life. They do. But it's just not, it doesn't quite hit like anime does. You're saying that 2D girls are better than 3D girls? (laughs) Uh, I plead the fifth. All right. We can move on. So as we said, summer is the time... Or wait a minute. No, we didn't say that. (laughs) Or wait. As we've said in the past, on the podcast at least, uh, summer is the time of year for spooky stories and haunted houses and whatnot. So we just did an episode about real haunted places in episode 104. Mm -hmm. But there are also haunted houses that pop up temporarily that you can visit. In Japan, that'd be pretty fun. Yeah. Another thing I get from my anime that I don't know how often happens in real life is the test of courage in summer. Oh, yeah. Anytime you take like an overnight vacation in summer, you've got to like wander to some shrine in the woods and there'll be someone wearing a mask out trying to spook you and. Everybody uses the opportunity to try to get with the person they like, and it never works out because it's anime. I'm pretty sure that happens exactly like that in real life. That's what I'm going to (laughs) say, just because I want that to be true. That sounds really fun. Right. I want to believe in a world (laughs) where anime happens in real life. Exactly. Another great thing to do in summer is to visit traditional Japanese gardens in full bloom, so to speak. Also, sure. public parks become very popular in summer. And I have to mention high school baseball. Oh. We've talked about before, but high school baseball is a thing. The Koshien tournament happens every summer. And 
I guess the closest analogy is kind of like March Madness. All of a sudden, the whole country tunes in, cares about baseball, even if they don't the whole rest of the year, because Koshien is happening. Yep. <laughs> Jason's like, I did a whole podcast about baseball for this guy. He still thought, brings it up. I thought we were done. I thought I never had to talk about baseball again. It's too culturally relevant, Jason. Yeah, I guess so. It wasn't in my notes, but no, you're right. It's a big deal. Okay, let's talk about summer holidays. All right. Tanabata. That's a holiday on July 7th or August 7th, depending on where you are, apparently. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. I looked into that a little bit. And it's held on the seventh day of the seventh month of the year, but based on like old calendars or some people using lunar calendars, there's certain areas where it happens in August and certain areas where it happens in July. Okay. Well, this is a pretty cool holiday. It has to do with a couple mythical celestial beings represented by a couple stars. Orohime? Orohime? Hikoboshi and... Hikoboshi sounds right. Hikoboshi, I'm confident about that one. And Orihime, maybe? Orihime. I'm trying to remember Haruhi. It's the star festival. Yeah, Orihime. That's okay. it. Represented by the stars Vega and Altair. Yeah. And Star Festival, did you say that? Yep. Yeah, called the Star Festival, because there are these two stars. And there's this legend about how they like they get to meet up once a year, their lovers. And, and you stuff. write your wish on a little piece of paper, and you hang it up on a bamboo branch. Yep. And it comes true, right? That's the idea. Sounds like a fun holiday. Yeah. Uh, the third Monday in July is known as Ocean Day. You can probably guess what that holiday is celebrating. Yep. August 11th is Mountain Day. You can probably also guess what that holiday is celebrating. And perhaps the most well-known holiday outside of Japan in summer is Obon, which is in August. And this is where families welcome back their ancestors and hang out with them and honor them and give them food. Maybe you've seen those things where they send a bunch of paper lanterns down the river or have them float away in the sky. Yeah. That's right at the end of Obon when they're sending their ancestors back to the afterworld. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty cool one. Yeah, definitely. So let's talk about food in summer in Japan. And there's one thing I really want to talk about. Yeah. Watermelon. Okay. Obviously, watermelon's a great summer food. But what I really want to do is I want to play Suikawari, which is split the watermelon. This is another thing I've seen in countless anime and manga. When you go to the beach, someone brings a watermelon, you wear something over your eyes so you can't see. They spin you around a couple times and give you a stick and you try to crush the watermelon, try to break the watermelon open. Wait, where's the watermelon? Just lay it on, the, on a towel or something okay. and on the sand. So it's like a pinata, but it's not moving. It just sits there on the ground? Yeah. Okay. Watermelon smashing. That sounds fun, I guess. I thought you were going to say you, uh, you start wrapping rubber bands around it. Have you seen that? I have, yeah. That seems like not as much fun because it explodes. What if you placed bets on which rubber band would break it? Does that make it more fun? Today I learned Jason's a degenerate gambler. Just an idea. People, you know, <laughs> no, people that like to bet on things and make it more exciting. No, blindfold makes it more fun. Okay. I just learned that Paul is really into blindfolds. Very interesting. <laughs> oh, God, that's on the record now. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to see someone do that in person or take part in it myself if possible. That yeah. sounds like a lot of fun. It's such a, it does sound it's like fun. a unique thing about Japan. Yeah. I don't know if they do that anywhere else in the world. Yeah, that's cool. Other foods that you're going to find in summer are things that are cooling, things that don't make you feel hot. You're not going to find a lot of hot foods in summer. So noodles are usually served cold like somen and zarusoba. For vegetables, you're going to 
have things like cucumber, sweet corn, edamame, mm-hmm. kakigori, I mentioned already, right? Uh, that's the shaved ice stuff. Also, uni, which is sea urchin, and unagi, which is eel, are popular summer seafood dishes. And both of those are, oh man, super, super delicious. Like, those are two of my favorite seafoods. What about popular fruits in summer, Paul? Fruits are big, right? Very big. I saw that Sato Nishiki cherries okay. are uh, especially popular. And I actually looked these up. These are like picture perfect cherries. Like imagine just the, I don't know, the, the perfect cherry. You got those two cherries hanging off those little green stems and they're just the brightest red, right? Mm-hmm. That's what these cherries look like. They're not all dark burgundy like our cherries here that you usually get okay cherries are so good yeah he is a huge fan of cherries when they're in season she'll just oh man it's ridiculous the amount of cherries she eats <laughs> um also ume japanese plum uh, melons peaches kyoho grapes blueberries strawberries and watermelon you already mentioned watermelon all mm-hmm. of those are popular in summer okay all great yep Except watermelon. I'm not a watermelon fan. Uh, what? You didn't know this about me? What? I'm... I didn't know there were people that didn't like <laughs> watermelon. I just don't. It's just, it's not flavorful enough, you know? It's so watery. Okay. I, I want like sweet fruits, like grapes and mangoes and pears. If you're getting the right watermelon, it's sweet. People say that, but... I've never had watermelon where I was like, yeah, this is delicious. All right. I've had watermelon where I was like, yeah, this isn't quite as bad as other watermelons, next, I guess. Next summer, every time I get a good watermelon, I'm going to be like, Jason, do you like it? Do you like it? Is this sweet enough? Is this good enough? Please do. All right. Try to get me a watermelon that I'll like. All right, I guys. Would, I'm, I'm going to see, I'm gonna see if I can get Jason to like watermelon. All right. We will report back. If you do want hot food, you got to go to a Matsuri and hit some of the Yatai the food stands, and then you can get all your classic street foods, some barbecue, stuff like that. Sure, yeah. As for clothing and decorative motifs, I got some monthly stuff again. In June, you're going to see hydrangea, blue iris, or sorry, blue flag iris. That's a specific type of iris, I guess. Lilies. Pampas grass. Have you seen that stuff? Do you know what that is? No. Pampas grass. So it's like this tall grass, and the tops are kind of like white and fluffy. In Ghost of Tsushima, that really popular video game, Mm -hmm. there are places where you'll just find huge fields of pampas grass, and you can just walk through it and run your hands through it, and it's real pretty. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Green maple leaves, water, and distant mountains popular june motifs in july you got morning glories bell flowers water lilies and running water august you got cotton rose more pompous grass and more morning glories okay yeah morning glories are beautiful i can't envision those what do they look like i remember the ones we used to grow in my yard i think were blue with little like white dots or stars on them, like bluish purple. They were great, but they really only bloom in the mornings. It's kind of kind of cool. You got to wake up early if you want to see them. Mm. I'm looking it up. Yeah, they're okay, I guess. I always think about the uh, Morning Glory Hot Spring at Yellowstone. Okay. That's a really cool looking hot spring. Okay, so if you're looking at beautiful flowers, well, that's kind of mid. I don't know. I don't I've know never been really into me. flowers. Flowers aren't my thing. Okay. All right, next season is autumn, which is September through November. What's weather going to be like, Paul? Cools off a little bit. As the temperature drops, the air gets drier. It's a nice, comfortable season. Okay, days get shorter. And the fall colors, man. Oh, my goodness, the fall colors. I mean, Japan is just, you know, they got all those mountains that are covered in trees. And when the fall colors start coming in, it's mind-blowing. Yeah. 
There are actually even specific species of trees in Japan that make the fall colors especially breathtaking. For example, momiji, that's the Japanese maple tree. I love this tree, Paul. The Japanese maple is such a cool tree because the leaves aren't like these giant maple leaves like we have here on maple trees. They're these little itty bitty leaves and they're so thin that like when the sun shines through them, they just light up like fire. It's crazy how bright red they are. Viewing the autumn leaves is called koyo. It's koyo season. Okay. Kyoto is considered one of the best places to view because it's surrounded by hills and mountains with lots of trees. Yeah. I have another tree to mention, another specific tree. The ginkgo tree. I don't feel that's where you're going. The ginkgo specifically? Oh, yeah. 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 That's a good one, right? It is. So they, they don't turn red. They just stop at yellow. And it looks really cool when you have a bunch of ginkgo trees together and they all drop their leaves and the ground is just covered in yellow like it's yellow everywhere there's actually a street in tokyo that's lined with ginkgo trees and they have a fall festival when the trees start dropping their leaves so just the whole festival is just covered in yellow it's really cool absolutely finding a little secluded shrine or temple is often a great place to see some really good fall colors Mm mm-hmm Uh, We talked not too long ago in episode 98 about Tofukuji, a temple in Kyoto, and there's a bridge there that you have to pay to walk across. And the whole reason people pay to walk across this bridge is to see the view of the trees beneath it. Yeah, because you're above the trees on the bridge. Yeah. Uh, When I went to Miyajima, which is near Hiroshima, there's a park there called Momijidani Park. And it's just packed with people ooing and eyeing and pointing their cameras up at the Momiji trees. Uh, another place I saw mentioned that I don't think we've talked about before is Eikondo Temple, which is also in Kyoto. It's supposed to be the number one destination for photographers in fall. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Must be, must be pretty exciting. Yeah. I don't think we mentioned specific temperatures in fall, right? We did not. Temperatures on average are around 18 Celsius or 65 Fahrenheit for most of the season. Sounds nice. Yeah. So like in spring, you can get by with just a sweater most of the time. You might want a jacket as it gets later in the season. And as I've said plenty of times before, this is my absolute favorite time to go to Japan. I don't like being hot. I don't like sweating. So when it gets nice and cool... And then you just got like a zip up hoodie so that you can kind of regulate your temperature by unzipping it or taking it off when you get too warm. It's just absolutely perfect. Can't argue with that. Yeah. Another thing I found is historically moon viewing was popular in September called Tsukimi. Although it's a little less popular these days, maybe because all the bright lights of the cities. I don't know. Uh, That makes uh, sense. I feel like, hey, if we're going to do evenings next time a little bit, we could do some moon viewing. Yeah. Autumn is also heavily associated with hiking. It's cool. It's the perfect time to get out there, see the leaves, be able to hike a long ways without getting too hot. Go explore in autumn. For sure. What type of holidays does Japan have in autumn, Jason? Well, we got some interesting ones here. Let's see. The third Monday of September is a national holiday called Respect for Elders Day, when you're supposed to respect your elders, I guess. Okay. September 23rd is the autumnal equinox, and during that week, it's tradition to visit the graves of family members that have passed away. The second Monday in October is Health and Sports Day, which is another national holiday, and this one celebrates health and fitness. And the reason it's at this time of the year, actually, is because the 1964 Tokyo Olympics started on October 10th. Oh, nice little historical nugget. Yeah. Halloween, of course, comes at the end of October, and that's been becoming more and more popular in Japan, I would say. Yeah. We spent time in Shibuya in 2016 for Halloween, and it was amazing. You've heard that in recent years, they're kind of trying to tone it down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're 
Are they still blocking off the, the intersection there? I mean, with the pandemic, the last couple of years, I don't know if they were really hardly doing anything. I'm sure there were still people. But uh, the big thing I saw is that they are banning public drinking around Shibuya Crossing yeah. for like a few days around Halloween. Interesting. Yeah. You can still drink in the bars there, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, November 3rd is Culture Day, celebrating Japanese culture. And the last autumn holiday is kind of an interesting one. It's 753 Day. Have you heard about that, Paul? Nope. It's on November 15th, and little girls aged 3 and 7 and little boys aged 3 and 5 are celebrated and people pray for their health. Okay. Isn't that random? Yeah. <laughs> All right, Paul, what about fall food? Mushrooms. Yum. A lot of produce coming from the mountains in fall. I saw Matsutake mushrooms specifically, by the way. Those are the most sought-after mushrooms in Japan. I don't know if I've had one of those. Hmm. Kind of harkening back to spring, they have clear soups, often with the mushrooms in it for a nice warm, earthy dish. Sounds tasty. For seafood, one of the most popular in fall is Sanma, or Pacific Sori. The kanji actually translates to autumn swordfish. Okay. Yeah, autumn food. Yeah. Persimmons are popular in the fall. Yeah. Persimmons are awesome, man. I love those things. And so is Japanese pumpkin. Other popular fruits are Fuji apples, nashi pears, sudachi, which are these little green citrus fruits, and mikan, which is a kind of Japanese orange type thing. Maybe the most interesting food item I stumbled across in this whole episode is a fall thing called maple tempura, where they take a fresh maple leaf salted or sugared and then fried with tempura batter as a snack. That sounds awesome. Yeah. I want to try that. There's also a lot of food shows or festivals in the fall too. Lots of cities have like Tokyo has a ramen show. Hokkaido has a food festival. Uh, so I guess, you know, it's the harvest season. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of food events going on that you can catch. Makes sense. What are you going to style with? What are you going to wear in the fall? Well, in September, you're going to decorate your kimono with autumn grasses, insect cages, at least for the first half of the month, then chrysanthemums, the moon, and gourds. Okay. In October, you got ginkgo, fall colors, nuts, fruits, and berries, and persimmon. Okay. In November, more fruits, nuts, and berries, wild geese, cranes, and bamboo. I feel like, I think those cranes and bamboo, that's kind of like welcoming in winter, because those are popular winter things too, I feel like. Okay. So now time to talk about everybody's favorite season, right? Winter! It was my favorite season until my skin started getting so dry that like my hands would crack and I'd just start bleeding and I'm just kind of miserable all winter. It's not even just the bleeding. I get these like little sores on my fingers. I don't know. I just, my body starts falling apart in winter. Am I oversharing? <laughs> yeah, I made, I made a joke about people actually liking winter, which you agreed to, you weirdo. And then you start talking about your hands bleeding. No, winter is great because nobody expects you to go anywhere. You can just stay inside all the time. <laughs> You're the guy that, that's like, I'm not a hickey <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm the guy that's like, I can't wait to retire so I can be a full-time hickey <laughs> All right, all right. I, I can't call you a neat because you have an education and a job. Yeah. But you are hickey At heart. Borderline. Borderline. Yeah. I drag you out every once in a while. 
Okay, come on. Let's. You don't need to overstate it. I do a lot of things. I I'm, go a lot of places. I'm exaggerating. I'm exaggerating. Jason's tried to get me to go to the hot sauce store like five times. I went and met new people the other day, and we jammed and played instruments, and I sang. Hikikomori doesn't do that. No, you're right. A little bit out of character for you, but that sounds like a lot of fun. I'm glad you did that. How's that out of character? You went somewhere and did a thing. I'm joking. Yeah. Kind of. Paul's exaggerating. <laughs> it's a running joke. There's a few things that get Jason going, and music's one of them. That's, that's for sure. That's very true. All right, well, let's talk about winter. Okay. We're talking December to February. Yep. It's cold. It's really cold. Yeah, but this is maybe the season that's going to vary the most depending on where you are in the country, right? If you're down in Kyushu or further south, you probably won't see a single snowflake. But up in Tohoku or Hokkaido, you're going to see billions, perhaps trillions of <laughs> snowflakes. Some places up there actually get more snow than anywhere else in the world. Average temperatures are going to range from negative 7 degrees Celsius, which is around 19 Fahrenheit, up to 6 degrees Celsius or 43 degrees Fahrenheit, depending on where you are. Okay. Tokyo does get some snows, although it doesn't usually stick for long. You're not going to see big piles of snow on the sidewalks in Tokyo, generally. Mm -hmm. So winter can be quite beautiful in Japan. Oh, yeah. As winter tends to be, mm -hmm. everything covered. If you go to a place where everything's covered in snow, it can look really amazing. You should go to Shirakawa go in winter. Oh, man. Yeah. The place is amazing. That seems like one of the best places to go if you want winter scenery. Mm hmm Can you briefly explain Shirakawa go for people who maybe didn't listen to that episode? Shirakawa go is a little mountain village. It's like pretty remote, or at least it feels really remote. And it's just got these little houses that are like hundreds of years old. They're all these little wooden houses, and they're, the construction of these things is really cool. Like They're very specifically designed for that specific climate in that part of the country. And in winter, it looks, it's just, I, 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 uh, I, don't, I, don't even, I don't have the words, Paul. It's like the most beautiful scene you can imagine. It's just this little snowy, village with these little cozy looking houses and you just see the little glowing lights peeking out the window but it gets so much snow there that like half of each building is just buried you know and they got like this huge layer of snow on the roofs yeah and they got these thatch roofs and stuff really slanted roofs so that less snow builds up on it but it still builds up like feet deep man they got these hearths where they're they have fires going inside all winter long it's just such an incredibly beautiful place. When I visited, it was actually at, in fall, but on the very last day when I left to go back to Tokyo, I woke up and it was snowing. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's so beautiful. It's like someone built the most beautiful snow globe they could think of and shook it up. And like, that's what you're going to see. Yeah. Let me find the episode number. Shirakawa. Go. Go. 64. Okay. Go, go check out episode 64 and then go visit this place because, oh man, one of my top two favorite places in the world. High praise. So, what are you going to do in winter in Japan? Winter sports, baby. Winter sports have become hugely popular in Japan. They had the Nagano Winter Olympics in 98, and they also had Winter Olympics in 72 in Sapporo as well. So uh, there's a lot of skiing, a lot of snowboarding, tons of winter resorts you can go to. There's over 500 ski resorts in Japan. It's a lot. Yes. Wow. Well, they got the mountains, so they got snow and they got slopes. Yeah. There's the Hakuba Valley in Nagano, which is very famous. There's 11 different ski resorts there. It's known for being a little bit steeper than what you might get in Hokkaido. Um, and also just great fresh powder all the time. Awesome. And then there's some hot springs towns nearby too. 
Have you ever experienced fresh powder, Paul? I still really haven't, honestly. Mm. I did once, I think in Breckenridge, Colorado. And it was, oh man. I can only dream. It's an experience. Yeah. We should do a snowboarding trip. Why haven't we done that? We've talked about it. Yeah. My snowboard has like solely broken one piece at a time over the last three years. Did you ever get your bindings figured out? No, I got to get a new board. Hmm. Like the... You just cannot find the old bindings that like work with the board I have anymore. It's just mm. like, can't do it. Well, get a new board and let's go to Utah or something yeah. this winter. I got new boots and I got new bindings, so it'd be a waste not to get a board. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good to me. Another big thing to do in winter in Japan is winter festivals. There's a really famous one in Sapporo. Yuki there, Matsuri. Yeah, there's another one a little further north in Hokkaido, too, that we talked about. Check out episode 31. That was about Hokkaido, which is the northernmost main island. And we talked about those winter festivals a bit. They're both in February, so you could hit up both in the same trip if you're that interested in winter festivals. Some places you'll also find European-style Christmas markets. Mm -hmm. Those are fun. Yeah. I went to one of those in Paris. Wow, okay. Yeah. That's cool. And we have one here. Have you been to the one here? No. Where? Uh, it's at Union Depot. Okay. It's it's okay. It's okay. All right. <laughs> the Holodazzle is also kind of a Christmas market sort of thing these days. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, we always have, we always have winter stuff going on here. True. Uh, another big thing in Japan is winter illuminations. Yeah. So many all over the place. Yeah. If you're the type of family, I don't know if you did this, Paul. When I was a kid, we would just drive around the neighborhood in the winter and go look at like the Christmas lights. Do you ever do that? Oh, yeah. More than I probably would have cared to. <laughs> really? I mean, it was like nice seeing it, but it was like the fourth time this winter and like I'm tired. I just, I was at school all day and then I was at basketball and my parents are picking me up and I'm like, ah, we're almost home. And like, oh, let's go check out this neighborhood and drive around and see all the light. It was like, ah. Uh. Mm. We didn't do it enough for me to get sick of it, I guess. But, but yeah, winter illuminations. They have specific places in Japan where they set up huge light displays. Like, these aren't just like houses decorated. This is like such a huge thing that you Talking actually like need to pay millions, to get in there. Millions of lights. Right. But even besides that, just around town, you see a lot of decorative lights, like Christmas light looking things. It's a big part of the winter atmosphere in Japanese cities. Okay. Christmas, we should talk about Japanese Christmas, right? Christmas is, of course, a Christian holiday, but it is actually celebrated in Japan, just in a slightly different way than it is in the West. Yeah. Christmas Eve is a romantic holiday for couples. Yeah, the most romantic night of the year, even. All it's the like a fancy restaurants we booked out. Yeah, but then Christmas Day isn't really that big of a deal. You get a Christmas cake and eat some KFC. Yeah. And you had Japanese Christmas. Yeah. Check out episode 24 to hear us talk all about Christmas in Japan. Mm -hmm. Paul, I look back at that. Can you believe that episode was only 23 minutes long? No, what? Yeah. What? Our episodes have gotten longer and longer and longer over time. And now this is going to be like almost two hours, probably, this episode. I didn't think we ever did an episode that short. I'm surprised. Yeah. Was that specifically, was that only Christmas or was that holidays? It was only Christmas. Okay. And then the next episode was uh, New Year's. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah, I suppose, I mean... There's only so much about Christmas in Japan. Yeah. Wow. That, that's that got to be our shortest one. It's gotta probably. It's gotta probably. Be. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned New Year's. New Year's comes pretty soon after Christmas. And that's a big deal. It's maybe the biggest holiday in Japan. Yeah, that might be fair to say. Yeah. Yeah. You got your shrine visit. You got your New Year's food. You got visiting family. It stretches out over a few days. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Check out episode 25 for all the stuff about New Year's. There's kind of a lot. 
There's I a lot bet going that on. one's longer than 23 minutes. I think it is. There's a lot of special foods to eat. There's a lot of special decorations to put up. There's a lot of special things to do. Yeah. One of which is uh, on, on the first of the year, or at least sometime that week, people will make their first temple or shrine visit of the year. That's a pretty big deal. Okay. Shrines and temples will be like more busy than any other part of the year. Uh, and then the second Monday of January is Coming of Age Day, when 20-year-olds are officially recognized as adults. Congratulations. Yeah. And then there's Setsubun, which is February 3rd, celebrated at Shrines and Temples Nationwide. And it's a very interesting holiday full of uh, demons invading your home and throwing beans at them to get them to go away and... A lot of fun. A lot of fun to be had on Setsubun. Awesome. And then February 14th, of course, we have Valentine's Day, which we talked about a little bit earlier with White Day. Yep. Uh, women give gifts to men on Valentine's Day. You remember what episode that was, Paul? 69. 69. It reminded me, actually, after we just talked about the Christmas episode and the New Year's episode, I think the reason Valentine's got pushed that far is because... We were like, we just did Christmas. We just did New Year's. Do we want to do another holiday episode so quickly? And we we're like, mm. I will do it next year. Yeah. Because we're not going to do Christmas and New Year's that year. That sounds right. And then magically, it happened to be episode 69. Sometimes we make the right choices accidentally. Magical. Uh, last holiday I have is the Emperor's birthday. And this is the new emperor. Yeah. Uh, Naruhito was born on February 23rd. So that's the last winter season national holiday. So you think winter is kind of a, you know, dead or hibernating time, but I actually found a few notes about wildlife that can be enjoyed in winter in Japan. Winter is the mating season for red crowned cranes. And they do an interesting mating dance. They're like hopping around and stuff with their wings all spread out, right? Yeah, so you can view that in Hokkaido. Yeah. January and February is the best time to see stellar sea eagles. Stellar sea yeah. eagles? Actually, stellar's sea eagles. So I don't know if that's named after a person or oh, something. Probably. But they follow the cod. And there's a bunch of cod in the sea at that point. So they're all around eating fish. Nice. Humpback whales migrate near Japan starting in December. So if you want to do some whale watching. Yeah. And then snow monkeys. Japanese macaw. Macaques. Macaques. Is it it a macaw? A macaw is a bird. Macaw? What is it then? Macaques. Macaques? No way. Yeah. You're fooling me. M-A-C-A-Q-U-E-S. I guess the plural. Do you want me to look I it up on YouTube? I guess plural, it's macaques. And singular is macaque. Look at macaque. <laughs> Japanese, J- Jason's trying to get me to say dirty words here. Japanese macaques. <laughs> <laughs> I feel, I'm, excuse me. Japanese macaques. Snow monkeys. It's not a dirty word because it's Japanese. It's a different language, guys. No, they're called something different in Japanese. That's the American word. What? Why is it so dirty then? Paul, this is YouTube. How to pronounce macaque. You ready to listen to this? Okay. How do you go about pronouncing this one? Macaque. You do want to stress on the second syllable. Okay, okay. Macaque. All right, so they're called macaques. You don't need to stretch out the cock part that much i don't think that's what that's what that's what the pronunciation said uh, you know you was, know anyone can just post stuff on youtube he was enunciating like really macaque macaque it's okay. a japanese macaque okay go see japanese snow monkeys yeah or macaque you ready to talk about winter food oh yeah in winter you want hearty foods that warm you up so maybe the biggest one is nabe Nabe, nabe, nabe. Also known as hot pot. You know, Yia was saying recently that we should get a hot pot dish thing. You should. You think so? Yeah. I mean, it'd be cool, but it takes up so much space for one specific dish. You know what I mean? Do you have space for it? Not really. Then don't get it. Okay. 
I wasn't planning on it. It's great, though, because you can throw anything into a hot pot. Yeah. Yeah. So hot pot's basically like just a big hearty soup, all sorts of fish and winter veggies, like daikon radish and cabbage. I, but yeah, you can really throw whatever you want in there. Just make a tasty broth for it. Let it simmer. And you can get this big hot pot dish that has like a heater kind of thing under it, like an electric thing, so you can keep it hot at the table and everybody just gathers around and picks out what they like. Yeah. Oden is another popular winter dish. Mm -hmm. Find that at Kombini convenience stores all over Japan. For New Year, like I said, there are a bunch of very specific seasonal foods and they're all like prepared in a specific way and there's tons of symbolism involved like each little food represents like a wish for good luck or good health and all this stuff episode 25 again if you want to hear more about that yeah and maybe the best part about winter food warm sake oh yeah soothe the soul warm you up from the inside out skiing all day, come back in, warm sake, and then hit the onsen. Oh, man. Paul, you're going to make me cry. Just thinking about a day of snowboarding and hot sake and then onsen at the end of the day. Oh, man. Yeah. There's also sake tasting festivals in the winter throughout yeah. Japan as well. That sounds fun. Any other food we should enjoy in winter, Jason? Yeah, well, you might think that there aren't that many food you know, seasonal fruits to eat in winter. But actually, there are. People like to pick yuzu, which is a tart citrus fruit, mm -hmm. kaki, which is persimmon, strawberries. What? Right? Would they grow them in a greenhouse? Exactly. They have a giant crop of greenhouse strawberries in winter. And there's, so there are actually places you can go to pick strawberries anytime between December and June. I think we messed up. How are we sitting here saying strawberries are seasonal food? An hour ago, I was like, strawberry is the food of spring. And then we were like, strawberry is great in summer. And now we're saying eat strawberries in winter. <laughs> just, eat, just always eat strawberries in Japan, except for spring, I guess. Spring, you're out of luck, except maybe? Except for fall. No, fall. Yeah, okay. I yeah. don't know. I mean, if you want natural outdoor strawberries then it's a spring thing. Okay. But if you are just a strawberry fiend and you want them in the off season, they're available. Okay. Winter is citrus season. So maybe in southern parts of Japan, they get that fresh citrus. So not talking about strawberry. Moving on from strawberries now. Sure. You were talking about yuzu before. Yes, yes. Um, other, other popular citrus hits in winter. All right. I didn't know that. That's just something you knew off the top of your head, that winter is a citrus I work Season. in produce now, bro. Oh, we're, oh, is that your? That's the department you manage now. I manage. It's one of the departments I manage. Oh, yeah. So you know, we're looking ahead. Like, what goes what goes on sale in January? Citrus. Huh. Cool. Well, I got some more uh, decorative motifs for the winter. In December, you got fallen leaves, barren fields, or winter trees. Bamboo and snow, of course. Yep, that makes sense. January, you got pine, bamboo, plum. Okay. Those three things bring anything to mind for you, Paul? Pine, bamboo, and plum. Shochikubai, that sound familiar? No. Shochikubai is the three friends of winter. Okay. We've talked about it before. Oh. It's, well, it's been a while, I think. I don't recall. It's a, a popular visual motif but also like on on uh menus sometimes if it's like a prefix menu they'll have these three tiers one more expensive than the last and they're they're pine bamboo and plum okay i forget what the order is i think plum is the cheapest one and bamboo is the most expensive maybe okay i could be wrong i'm not going to google it i'm just going to let myself sound like a dummy if i'm wrong <laughs> also in winter, uh, sorry, in January, cranes, those dancing cranes you were talking about, tortoises, and folded paper cranes. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then in February, you got plums, daffodils, and holly. 
I guess, starting to turn the corner there into spring. Okay. I think that wraps up seasons for us, right? I think so. Man, you know, remember at the end of the last one, I was I was not so sure about this as a topic. Yeah. I think really the main problem I had is just that we've kind of mentioned so much of this stuff in other episodes, it almost felt like a, a clip episode. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Just referring to things that we've already sort of covered. And yeah. we did reference a bunch of episodes that we've done in the past, but but man, I didn't expect there to be like just so much to say, I guess. I I wasn't sure at first until I started putting my notes together and I was like, I have a ton of notes. Yeah. What do you say? 11 pages of yeah. notes? Yeah. Normally I'm like five to seven maybe. Hmm. But yeah, I just wanted to do it because like we said in the intro, like Japan, they take their seasons really seriously. It's really important to them culturally. Mm-hmm. So having this all together in one place, I think maybe will be useful for some people. Yeah. Hopefully. I hope so. I hope so. And it, there are a few interesting things came to light that we might not have talked about before. Yeah. Like my bleeding hands, right? <laughs> yeah. Today we learned. <laughs> I'm trying to keep them moisturized this year. I'm not going to let that happen. I tried last year keeping my skin moisturized. and I gave up after like a month. So you had bloody hands too? Eh, it was more like itchy legs. Oh, yeah. And it was like, I lotion every day and I doesn't seem to even be helping. You know, my problem is I don't want to like get my hands all greasy and covered in lotion because I'm always typing. I don't want to get my keyboard all slimy and stuff. Here's one thing I learned when I was a server because I had to wash my hands constantly and I oh, had that problem. Yeah. Is it even helps just every couple of hours, put a little bit on the back of your hands and just rub the back of your hands together. Don't even put anything mm. on your palms. Just rub it back your hands together. Go back to typing or whatever. Do that a few times a day. That's a really good tip. Because the place I always start bleeding is my knuckles. Yeah. And you don't... Yeah, the palm is fine. Tips of my fingers are fine. Yeah, just keep your fingers together so it doesn't get like between your fingers. Yeah. Thank you for that tip. You're welcome. Where can people find us, Jason? What, you want me to give them our address? Dox us now, immediately. I already gave them our latitude, so... Uh, you know, we're, we're findable. Our longitude is, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> if you want to find us, you can do that on the interwebs. We're very accessible on the interwebs. Sightseeingjapanpodcast.com is our website. We're on Instagram at SJP Podcast. Mm-hmm. We're also on Facebook, facebook.com slash sightseeingjapanpodcast. I'm also on Twitter and I never post anything and, uh, yeah. All right, so don't follow Paul on Twitter. <laughs> don't waste your time. Yeah. You know, I don't mention it enough, but if you want to help spread the word about the podcast, tell your friends. I know you have some friends that are all into Japan, right? Or you could tell the world by going to wherever you found the podcast and leave a review. That would be really helpful. Absolutely. Help spread the word and... It's nice reading reviews. Yeah. I enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that's left reviews for us. Yeah. Except that one hater like two years ago. That wasn't a review. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was just a direct comment. Yeah. No, but that was funny too. I got a good chuckle on that. Yeah. Anyway, Paul, what are we talking about next time? Oh, the next episode. We are talking about Kappa. Paul, I think this one might be a contender for like the most fun episode like it might topple the tanuki episode maybe it's gonna be right up there yeah we've talked about tanuki we've talked about oni we've talked about tengu we're gonna talk about kappa they're just as prevalent and even wilder probably yeah one of the most well-known yokai or monsters in japan and they are freaky man (laughs) they're gross they're weird they're kind of disturbing in a lot of different ways but they're also kind of cute sometimes yep yep (laughs) so that'll be fun thanks for listening we'll see you next time